um, uh, great demos status demos status status as usual uh, demos sipka demo uh, no no demos what? I'm busy yeah I'm sorry so busy with actual work that sucks thank you uh, in other news SpaceX did it they did it SpaceX yes we just don't yes. want it Hey, Super. Brett, you're yeah. here. Hey, man. We, we talked about it for the last five minutes, so I was like, what is he talking oh, about? Oh, I missed that. I'm sorry. <laughs> he took... Sipka's doing his best Piotr imitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I got. Thanks, Sipka. Yeah, it was awesome. So who has some demos? Zoltan is not opening his microphone, so I assume he doesn't have any demo. Okay. Yeah, no, sorry. So I will do the demos today. I will do Ultra 2. Many things. I did many things. Well, it looked it looked a lot for me. We'll, we'll see what it shows up in demos. Um, then, uh, gallery. It's been a week. <coughs> Just to see. There are some issues. I will talk about them. Well, there is there are two issues. But they're not really big issues. So gallery. Um, am I missing any topic? Um, let me see from last week. I don't have any update on radio system code. Uh, there was no topic last week either. One topic will be vacations. Okay, status. I see that um, Sipke worked a lot. Orchard. And there are many bugs on the CI, actually. We need to fix it. Hello. It's packing. Okay. So six days ago, let me see. This was seven days ago. We talked about it. I think. Um, yes, we talked about it. Then long running orchard commands crashed. So this was a pull request, I think, that we accepted. And um, the idea being that the command line tasks would lose their um, reflection lease, or oh, sorry, their remoting lease. So everything which implements Marshall by ref object now defines the a bigger lease. I have no idea how it works, but but Matt seemed to understand the issue and fix the issue, so we'll agree with that. So you see everything which uh, inherits from Marshall by ref now overrides initialized lifetime service and returns null. But I have seen this issue also by the past, so this should be fixed. Um, fixing indentation, we don't care. Uh, this is a branch on master, yes, this is a, a so whenever there is a change to do on the readme, at MD, we need to do it in the master branch, and uh, this is changing the URL for the um, Orchard package on Azure if you want to uh, test drive it on Azure. Um, this one is from Sipke Layout Editor JavaScript issue. Let me see what branch is the blue one. No, it's in dev now. So everything here has been merged in dev. Uh, layout Designer issues. Uh, this is the Markdown patch using correct key when removing rediscussion tree from Piotr. Yeah, apparently, we were not deleting the correct key here because everything is generated by using get localized key. So, same thing for the deletion. Um, tokenizer from Jean Thierry fixing another ref. This was a pull request from um, the triage meeting on Thursday. I think this one broke a bunch of unit tests. I have to check, but after this day with all these pull requests, I saw a, 
some unit test failing on the CI. Uh, but it shouldn't because it's just a null check. Uh, update default layer evaluation service. This one also from Jean Thierry. I pinged um, Chris Payne. No one from Big Gaming is here. I don't know. Doesn't seem. Rob, Rob, you are from Big Gaming, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. So we update. You remember you were yeah you were there at um, the harvest. You remember the pull request we accepted from um, Chris that was supposed to remove a select n plus one. Uh, yeah. We we were right by saying there was no select n plus one actually in the in the most update up to date code because we we never act in the in this code right after that right after that you will see we just access active layer yeah what wait yes that's good active layer dot content item at id and active layer dot layer rule in some old code there was active layer dot record dot layer rule and this will do a select n plus one because for each act for each um, layer there will be a call to dot record which will do a select n plus one but this was old code because this thing is taken from the info set there is no query by doing that so this thing was no more uh, needed the, the f what uh, chris has had found was actually not anymore an issue uh, but this code is ch it changed made actually some um, the query to be more expensive by doing some more joins on tables so jean thierry reverted the change just to say filter on the type and not filter on the records by expanding the query hints so that was the change okay that looks, looks right i pinged him on github so we'll see what he says um http context accessor uh, yes what is this one This is from the um, from the branch with uh, with the thread static remove node. Yeah, why is there a single commit here? Oh, it's part. Okay, it's part of all the commits there, maybe. Oh yes, this is this one. This is part of a, a bigger pull request which fixes the iWork context accessor and IHTP accessor in different background task, context, dependency injection, all the issues that was related. Um, so this is a, a huge change, but yeah, but it's supposed to fix the work context accessor and shipping context uh, availability in every kind of request or process. Um, and there are three of them. So this is this one, this is patch six, this is the tokens, and this is the uh, HTTP context. Okay, so three different pull requests from Jean Thierry on Thursday. Uh, this is the user pull request we talked about, and this is this is um, apparently correctly. Yeah, there was a, an issue with um, these libraries, which were not taken into account, were uh, by the, the Git ignore. So they, if you update them, they will not be taken into account. In git so it fixed the getting now i don't know for what reason oh because there is a lib folder inside this module why is that that's the issue mm, that shouldn't cause any issues because uh why why was it ignored if you just or what happens here here it's not ignoring so it's actually including yes yeah. but these libraries should be in the lib folder because whenever we have a core module we don't include the libraries in the subfolder of the module we include them in the main lib so that's the issue okay um can someone create an issue for that? Linking to this one, which is 6178, saying that actually the file should be in the lib folder. 
so it's not worse but the correct solution is to move the lib uh, from this module to the lib folder unless there is a reason not to but I don't think so okay and this is merge 19x2 dev branch to reflect all the changes then uh, lombic creating helpers for settings based metadata scenarios to be used in migration I didn't see this one helpers as widget with identity okay oh you, you see you know the one I would like to see if you start doing things like that there is an issue open for that for the fields to say add field and um, but for each module each module could define their own its own um, set of extension methods like add taxonomy field this will help so many people because when you want to add a taxonomy field there are there are like 10 lines of code to add as settings but if you had a add taxonomy field with a name and the taxonomy id boom this is for the uh, for the scenarios where you um, actually add parts as well so widgets and media so now you don't have to specify mm -hmm. add widget part add common part stereotype should be widget this is update from two okay identity part okay And uh, you updated the documentation, I assume? Oh no. Uh, <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, the as widget with identity. Uh, do you have a just a as widget without identity? Yes, um, why don't that's you, why there is this. Yeah. Why is don't you just say, I would say, just as, well. as widget dot with identity. Yeah. Ah, so yeah, that we would could. return some builder. It, it would return the same a case where you would never want an identity part with a widget. Well, that's why he says there is a NAS widget, and that's why I'm saying why not have a NAS widget and also a with identity. Distinct. Oh yeah, but but I'm saying <clears throat> why not just use as widget as the name, and that implementation would always add an identity part. That's dangerous. Some... Maybe you don't want it all the time. Me. I don't know. Yeah, that was that was the rationale behind that. And at the same time, with identity makes sense for many other things. So I could use a dot with identity also. Hmm. Oh, so you're suggesting that the with identity would be a different one. Yeah. Just doing that. Generic. Okay, that looks good because see there is a nice widget. Uh, good. Like it. I want the same thing for each field. <laughs> um, then. Lombic adding the ability to specify tokenized default values for content fields. Tokenized default values. Yeah, that was that was something bigger. So now basically when you add uh, Ooh, a text field, for crap. example. Yeah. Oh wait, wait, wait okay. Def what is that? Default value. So you change every field default value yeah so if you add the field 
Um, and we have did it for text field, daytime, enumeration, input, link, and numeric field. If you had a field um, in the content type, uh, content type settings, you can specify a default, a default value that will be used if the user doesn't uh, doesn't choose anything or doesn't uh, input any, anything. You were there on the issue, Sebastian. So okay, I trust me. Shouldn't be too big surprises. It is. When was it? Last week? I forgot. Like half a year ago. Oh, that's why. <laughs> Let me see. Which? Are you, oh, yes, you. Um, as default value, so only boolean field as default value setting. This <laughs> what Tanasol? Who's this guy? But that's you, you. You we always have this kind of having this feature will be great. Still okay, and this value should be recognized. Oh, look at that! Very interesting. That's a good comment. Yes, that's a very good comment. This value should be tokenized. If you could add default values for every content field, that would be great. Uh, that's an opinion. I changed to the... Uh, okay. So default value, which means if you don't define anything, it will be over. Okay, good, good. So something else you can do. I think I have talked about it during the meeting, but I'm not sure. Probably not. Um, you Localization. You all know about localization. We can do great things with Orchard in terms of localization. But there is one feature that people ask in terms of localization is they have a content type which is localizable. Okay, So every culture will have a different content item which will point to the master language content item. Good. But what they say is that, let's say we have an e-commerce. And uh, in every culture, the color is the same. Okay, The color picker, for instance. Whatever the language, the pink color is pink color. Even if the name changes, the pink color is the same. So what they want is a field that will be the same for every culture. So that if you change it in one content item, it should not vary by culture. Okay? Um, and today it's not doable because we have one content item per culture. So each the field is duplicated, the field value is different in every content item. Um, but actually, we can do that. Um, just stop me if I already said that. But what we can do is a global setting for fields. So like, uh, um, like uh, let's say Zoltan, like because he's here. Like Zoltan did for the, um, where is that? Where is this thing? You see the events? Oh, not this one. This one. See. Like an, a global field editor event, which will say for any field if it has, so it can create an editor for all the fields saying doesn't vary by culture. It's a checkbox. All the fields will have it. And we can do that with this editor event because we can override the editor for all the fields. And, and then when you check that, don't vary by culture. It will also intercept every content published event, look at the fields, and if any field has this checkbox uh, checked, then it will take this the field value itself, which is a pure string or object, and copy the same value to all the other content items of the same master content item language. So when you edit one item in one culture, it will be applied on all the other content items of every culture. This way, we support fields which are not varying by culture. Make sense? Great idea? Easy implementation? Um, it, it doesn't feel too uh, too clean, but we actually did the same for for some some selected uh, values and for our for our own custom content parts for several projects. Okay. So basically, this content synchronization is yeah, it's a it's a good workaround. It works. And this way, we support per culture fields and one culture field. That, that makes sense. It's easier for us to, to maintain. That works, I think. And it, it works with draft. So you can draft any content item, even the master one. And 
Or another way to do that is if the checkbox is enabled, we don't render the editor for non-master culture. It's optional, but, but this way, when you change the master culture, it will still copy the field everywhere, but you don't see it in the editor, but the value will still be there everywhere. That's another optional implementation. But yeah, I think that would be great. People have asked for that, um, fields that don't vary by culture. We should do that. I think uh, if there is no issue for that, we should open an issue for that. Um, okay. I think it's a great idea. And Zoltan will copy, paste his implementation in another pull request. Okay, there is a discussion. I don't see it. It's okay. So, uh, thank you, Lombic, for that. And I'm looking forward to the next one with the field localization. Uh, removed unnecessary HTML model map from Sipke. This is in layout, so we'll trust him. Yeah, when, yeah, look at that. All the code is removed. Look at that. Faster, better, less bugs. Fix a potential issue with new container element. It's in layouts. Um, again, in layouts. Interesting. Are you fixing actual bugs? Or is this something that you find on the go because you are using layouts module? Yeah, it's both. So I'm writing a walkthrough on creating <coughs> uh, container elements. And then I'm discovering bugs and improvements to simplify the custom implementations. OK. So it's, it's a mix. So layout improvements. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Uh, done. Questions on the updates? I have two things here. Oh, interesting. I should push that. Yeah, because who likes the code I list of dynamic cast from an ID blocker cast dynamic of a dynamic object? That's very obvious. But we can just cast that to dynamic. That's better. And this file, I will need to commit it because every time I open Visual Studio, it asks me to change that. So I will do that. Okay, good. No questions. Um, I will start with the gallery. Um, gallery, so we have two issues. And I will try to explain. And by explaining, I will uh, also think out loud. Oh, I didn't see that many issues, actually. Interesting, because I'm watching the repository. So issue with, OK. Issue with search results. I didn't. I didn't see these issues. Crap. Uh, just did a search Google Code Prodify to find the module. Blah blah, and it does not show up in the search results. Mm, okay. And okay, searching in Prodify. Uh, Okay, so apparently when you search for something, the default order is still oldest to newest, which, which is apparently the default order, whatever, even if you don't do searches, so that's a bug. Okay. Um, Portugary versions, okay, this one is the one I wanted to talk about actually. So if you look at Cascade Bootstrap 3359, OK? Um, if you look at the versions here, you will see that 9 is at the top and 11 is in the middle. But should be the, well, is what people will ex expect to be the latest. I try to explain the issue here. The issue is that there are two versions of Semver. There is a Semver v1 and Semver v2. The current one is called Semver v2. And they don't behave in the same way uh, regarding the last part on the right here. Um, this part is called the patch part, I think. Um, yes, because there is major, minor, build, and patch part. Uh, in Semver v1, 
the last part, the patch part, is evaluated. I think. What did I say? The V1 is alphanumeric, and we are using the V1. And in the V2, it's correct. The issue is that in the last part, you can have something like RC, beta, alpha, alpha 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So to be able to compare that with numbers is just using alphabetical order. Okay, so alpha will be less than beta, which makes sense, will be less than RC, which makes sense alphabetically and in terms of uh, software engineering. Okay, um, which means 11 is lower than 9 or than 2. <laughs> um, and this is why if you look at the ASP.NET packages or the core stellar packages, you will see something like 4009000 and not just 9. Because this way they can say 9000. Automatic voice message system 5208226605 wow, is not available. One second. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. That was uh, Gustavo apparently from his phone. So muted Gustavo. Um, yes, so it uses 9000 instead of 9 because this way, when you start with 9000, you can do 9000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 20, and whatever. It will work, okay, increasingly in terms of numbers. Um, so if I go to NuGet.org and I look for something with MVC, uh, well, that didn't work. Crap, is when I want to look for a specific one. Okay, you will see the version number exactly not what I wanted to show. But I have lots of examples where they use dash one zero zero something exactly. Um, so, yep, so the ah, where is that? The issue is this the issue is that the, uh, I assume that oh and I think that now by default it will force you to enter just three parts maybe something like this so you don't use the last part so there is no ambiguity but right now the algorithm is alphanumerical and not just with numbers because you can type anything in the end so I will look at uh, how we can solve this because NuGet is using semver1 which is not what we are using apparently here and in semver2 it's obvious that if it's just a number they are compared compared as numbers Make sense? Um, can't find the source code okay i need to publish the source code that's the issue i agree suggestion for gallery modules and themes Oh, there are three different suggestions, and I think we agree with all of them because they are part of the roadmap. We also bring last update date. This, I think, is wrong. We show up the creation date, which will be the last update date. I have to check. Uh, Orchard version compatible like 19X. This is on the roadmap so that we can tag every package with what version is compatible with. And uh, notification mechanism. This is weird. Uh, we can't ask someone to forcibly update their package because there is an Orchard version and automatically close the thing. No, if it still works for Orchard 1.8x, it should be written works with Orchard 1.8x. I'm not saying that, no, it hasn't been tested with 1.9x. That's it. Uh, so suggestions. That's the issues that are on the gallery. Feel free to open any of them. Uh, currently, you still can't register because I still have SMTP issues with the gallery. I think I will create my own SMTP account um, because then you get the you get the donate foundation one doesn't work for me i don't know why uh, that's it for the gary questions
Did I miss anything on the chat? Okay, I don't know what this discussion is about, but okay, no questions going on. Um, holidays. Um, so Thursday is the 24th. There won't be any triage. I don't expect anyone to show up. Um, next Tuesday, I'll be on vacation. I'm not sure I will show up. So I will remove it from the recording. But if I if I go at a meeting during my free days, my wife kills me usually. Um, Okay, thank you, Zoltan. So up to you to decide if there is a meeting next week or not. I think we can skip vacation for next week. Everyone agrees? Yeah. Nobody will work anyway. Well, maybe in Hungary. But yeah, we, what, we yeah, actually but do. Lots of countries where small children work still, even during the holidays. So just talk for yourself. <laughs> Um, so okay, so no, we'll meet up then next time on in twenty which will be a Tuesday, Tuesday the fifth, okay. Good, good, good. Uh, gallery, triage. Uh, demos, no questions? Okay, so demos. I'm the only one to give a demo, so I will show you the progress on uh, Orchard 2. Um, and feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. So what did I do? Um, and Nick also. Oh, Nick, Nick, yeah. Nick merged my pull request. He's so kind. Uh, seven days. So Nick is still working on the recipe story. Um, he's working on it, I know, and doing some progress. Um, so yes, mostly support for configurable admin themes. So this uh, is a new thing in Orchard 2. You know that in Orchard 1, there is one admin theme. It's called called the admin, and you can't change it unless you use a very specific trick to change it. Um, in Orchard 2, what I did is add a setting for the name of the admin theme to use. So as we have a setting in Orchard 1 for the theme to use in the front end by default, okay, because you can still override it, but from the setting there is one and any user logic can override it. This is the same way for the admin now. There is a setting for the default one on the admin and any module can override what name of, of the theme should be used. But I assume that people will use um, the setting to change what theme to use. So now there is a setting and I will show you how it works. Uh, I updated the license to reflect uh, .NET Foundation, um, specify the clause, update the name to Orchard, uh, that's it. I also created, a, oh, and that's, a, so there is a, actually it was an open discussion from the .NET Foundation forum about how to display this kind of information, contributors and license. So I followed the, the suggestions. So the suggestion is, by the way, explained in the file itself. There is a contributors file that um, every of you who contributes to the repository can and should update when on their first contribution. Uh, the idea is that you contribute in your name by stating your name and a link to your GitHub account. 
if you contribute as part of a company, you create a section of your company and you add your name with your GitHub account. So it's not complete, it's just the people I knew uh, about. Uh, I checked for Bertrand, but Bertrand didn't contribute to the repository yet, so I didn't add him, even though he's contributed intellectually. Or maybe we should do that, actually. <laughs> It counts, I assume. Um, it does, right? <laughs> yeah, if you want. Um, well, some some of the things which are implemented are your ideas, so yeah, why not? Um, so I added Lombic. Um, I checked Benedict doesn't have any accent in his name, but Soldan has, so I took care of that. Uh, and please add yourself Thank if you have contributed. Okay, so whenever you create a pull request, the pull request can contain the addition of your name. And the order is in chronological order. That's explained that there too. Not in alphabetical or whatever. This is chronological. This way, Nick will always remain the first in the list. Beautiful, right? He would love it. If he's not here. He would love it. Um, so that's a, a change. Um, Okay, let me show you the admin theme, by the way, uh, in, in, well, let me, so admin theme, I need to show you how it works. Uh, then, Gulp support and ultra resources module. Um, so because I wanted to work on the admin theme, I needed static resources. So I needed to support ultra resources, which is a new module in Orchard one with all the static assets and also support for the Gulp pipeline. So I added the Gulp pipeline. Um, there is, though, an issue. Let me see if this is taken care of there. So the issue with Gulp and MVC6 is that MVC6 does, uh, and ASP.NET 5 in general does way more things that it used to do in, in in the past and gulp is one of the things which is supported and also re kind of required by default uh, in ASP.NET 5. The idea is that well the, the main issue being that when you start an ASP.NET 5 or MVC 6 app it, it doesn't serve static files by default meaning if you have a CSS it won't return the CSS if you do a request for that. Um, so if you want to serve static files, it's opt-in. You have to add the middleware in the ASP.NET 5 pipeline to serve the static file. So from your startup code, it will be something like uh, service dot um, use static files or use static middleware, use static files, let's say it's use static files. And this way it will serve the static files, but from a very specific folder, from the folder which is, which is defined in the project JSON here, which is called the web root. And this is the name of a folder. And this will appear here in your solution. So um, when you say that, by default, if you just say that, web root, dub dub root, or whatever folder you want, like static, it won't serve the file. It will serve the file only if in your startup you do, I have it somewhere, <laughs> probably there, you do, crap, I don't remember why I, where I have it. Interesting. Must be somewhere here. Yes, use static file, not add. Use static file. It's use. Yes, use. Um, oh, a convention. Uh, if you don't, it's very interesting. Also, uh, this comment. Um, Sometimes you will see dot add something and dot use something. Okay, the difference semantically is just that when you say use, this middleware that will be injected 
is the last one to occur if it works. For instance, when this middleware will say that, oh, it's a static file, I will return it, use just means when it returns the file, it won't do anything else after that. It won't call the next in the pipeline. Like use Orchard route middleware, if Orchard intercepts the route and says, oh, this is something for my module, then it won't go to the next one, okay? Which will be this one in this case. Uh, that's the, 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 the convention with use versus add. Add will go to the next one, but it's just a convention for naming, okay? In your middleware can do whatever it wants. It's just a, so that when we read the code, we understand what it does. So it's use static files. Uh, so if you add that, then by default, it will take the folder to serve static, static files from in the project.json web route. But you can change these values or you can add an option to use static files here to define what folder or folders you want to serve by default, if not the one from project JSON. I didn't change that. I'm still keeping the project JSON so far because there are many other issues. Um, so the big change with Orchard 2 right now, but it can change and it will probably change. So, so far, the idea is that every assets that you have in modules will be copied into the dub dub root during a specific step, for instance, publication or the first time you download the repository. And we can do such things by adding some scripts here, pre-publish and post-restore. So whenever you download Orchard and you will do a DNU restore to restore all the NuGet packages, it will also execute the command gulp publish, which is a new command in the gulp pipeline for Orchard, which will do here, there is a new command called publish now, which will look at all the assets that are defined in your modules. For instance, uh, this one, where do I have assets here? Assets here, you see, SCSS files. Look for the assets, oh sorry, the assets files actually. Look for that. Get the file that has been generated by the Gulp process and copy this thing to this file to the dubdubroot folder under the convention, which is the name of the module and the location where this file is generated, like styles vadmin from the module vadmin. So in vadmin, styles vadmin.css and also the min file which was generated by the same gulp file. So the assets are copied into this static folder and only this one is rendered, which means also from your templates, you render the links like tilde slash uh, dub dub root slash the admin. No, no, sorry. Is that it? No, it will be tilde slash the admin. Um, yeah. It's the admin directory. So this folder will be served at the root. Okay. So this will be tilde slash the admin styles the admin.css. Okay. You don't have to specify the module because it, it will be, it's the module name, not the, the module location. And it, it, it is unique wherever your module is or your theme is. Any question on that so far? Can you show your task runner explorer? Yes, look at that. Build, publish, rebuild, watch. Because I don't have tasks in mine. Uh, I see gulpspy.js. Because you need to install npm and gulp. So if you... I did. But... Okay. Uh, you... <coughs> Antoine, you, uh, if you just go to the... Um, Here, click uh, that. It yeah, should install everything automatically. Work. And just open the package, the JSON file, and save. Oh, that will yes. cause Visual Studio to download the uh, Node.js packages. Yeah. This one. Yeah, open that one and save. Or from the command line, uh, npm install from the, this folder, and it will download all the packages and install everything. Okay. It okay. means you don't have Gulp locally. Yeah, so that's the current behavior. Um, the next goal is actually to serve the static files from their own folders, but it means configuring the static file provider to point to all the static folders that can be served from a module um, explicitly. 
uh, that can be tricky and also uh, uh, some risk in terms of security because if you don't know that this can be served, you could put some, yeah, I don't know, maybe not. But the idea is that the, in, in ASP.NET 5, you, so everything in ASP.NET 5, many things in ASP.NET 5 might be uh, influenced by Orchard because the architect of ASP.NET 5 was also the architect of Orchard. So all the great ideas he had for uh, Orchard, he said, well, this was a great idea when I was working on Orchard, so let's put the same idea in ASP.NET 5. So for instance, everything is abstracted, even the file system. You know how we have the app data and the website folder abstraction in, um, or the storage or implementation or the file system abstraction in Orchard? There is the same thing in ASP.NET 5. So whenever we say um, use static file, there is an option in this thing that takes a static file option and in this static file option there is a file provider which is the actual implementation of something that lets you browse files the default one is just a physical file provider which will look at the file system itself but you could have a file system which is in database and the static file middleware doesn't care because it just takes something which implements i file provider which returns files and lists directories like in Orchard. and um, the idea if we want to to support multiple folders to be served is to use a specific implementation called combined file provider which will itself which is itself a composite of i file provider so you can take multiple folders and make them as file providers and put them in a combined file provider this way it will serve different physical folders from a same, same uh, virtual file system. That's how it's done with static files. And that's how we should manipulate files everywhere in ASP.NET 5. So that if tomorrow your file system is some random shared disk or Dropbox or OneDrive, it will work also the same. Uh, who is the architect, you mean, or the architecture? The architect is Louis de Jardin. Um, and he's not French. Um, that's the idea. Okay, so static file is done. Then uh, route generation is just about um, having a list of routers pertinent. This way it should be faster instead of having all the tenant routes at the same level. This is the same trick we use in Orchard 1. Very small thing. Um, this is the thing. Pipeline generation. What is that? Improving the pipeline generation. Oh, yes. Uh, I put the static file middleware first because if some file is requested, let's not run Orchard. Okay? <laughs> Just for that. So static file is first now. I also did some comments. Um, about what the middleware is doing every time it's registered. That's simple. Uh, this one I removed the, 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 the stopwatch. I also removed some ex uh, exceptions log. Oh no, if the file is not, if the route is not found, we don't throw an exception, we just return a 404. That's okay. And this one, yeah, and this middleware was copy pasted from Orchard one, but doesn't make sense anymore because we now have the Orchard container middleware, which will do everything here. Um, that's it. Uh, then I worked on the caching, caching in terms of uh, shapes. Uh, and I will take also uh, the occasion to explain you how caching works in ASP.NET 5. Again, great ideas which look a lot like in Orchard. So in Orchard we have the notion of iCache Manager that has the notion of um, volatile token which is a thing that has a boolean has changed. This way when you add something in the cache manager in Orchard you have the context dot signal you can add this, uh, when file change when path change you can add an iClock token you can add many ways to invalidate some cache entry and it's, it's the volatile token in Orchard. And by chance, this is exactly the same thing in ASP.NET 5. Um, and they still call it, they call it change token. You add an item, well, it's, 
syntactically a little bit different because you say um, you set a key like in Orchard and then you do dot add token and you add the token you want to invalidate the entry. In Orchard is a lambda which defines the, the token. It's a little bit different, but that's the same thing. And it's called iMemory cache. And remember that in Orchard, the cache manager is only implemented in memory, okay, in the local machine. If in Orchard we want to share the cache with some other instances, we use another interface that we call iCache service. Okay? And guess what? In ASP.NET 5, there is another service called iDistributed cache. Okay? So in ASP.NET 5, when I say ASP.NET 5, it also works for MVC 6. There is iMemory cache for the things that you always want on your local machine. That, and that is not shared across instances, and there is an ID, but can be invalidated across instances, and there is an ID distributed cache that has this constant shared across, across instances. And the default implementation for ID distributed cache is actually using the iMemory cache. Like we have in Orchard, the iCache service is actually using the ASP.NET cache. Um, because by default you have ju just have one instance and you just re register a new implementation to distribute your, your cache uh, thing. And the two interfaces are completely different because like in Orchard, the cache, serv the cache, ser cache manager has lots of ways to invalidate the, the entries, file system, clock, uh, signals, everything you imagine. But the cache service slash I distributed cache can just set and get or clear the cache or invalidate an entry. Okay, That's all it can do because we need to be more relaxed uh, uh, about the, the implementation that we require for a distributed cache. So that's the same thing. So um, in Orchard 2, this module, there is a difference actually. So what I implemented is a module that will register um, a memory cache implementation, the default one, and also a default distributed cache with the in-memory. And every module can register a different implementation like Redis, SQL Server. Oh, by the way, in ASP.NET 5, you, you get uh, implementations for the ID distributed cache using Redis and uh, SQL Server by default. They are there in the, in the framework. Uh, and the Redis cache implementation has been developed by the Redis uh, team in Azure. Uh, that, so that should be okay. So we won't have to do that, for instance. We will just have a module which will register this implementation when the module is enabled. Uh, this is a fix, and this is navigation and shapes, which is a big change, actually. Uh, this is adding, wow, I did everything last week. This is crazy. Uh, Gulp assets, um, memory cache, cache providers, uh, menu, menu generation. So I ported the menu generation code from uh, Orchard 1 and also simplified it so that nobody is talking. Am I just boring? Is it fine? No questions? Just let me know, okay? Or leave. <laughs> um, so. Are you feeling insecure, Sebastian? Yes, because no one is giving feedback, so maybe. No, this is great. Ah, this looks awesome. Okay, but, but well, Sipko, I know you like it, but I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it's out of uh, of context, and okay. Um, so what I was saying, yes, the menu implementation. So I created the navigation module, and I reused everything I could from Orchard One, minus the complexity. Because in Orchard 1, we have two different APIs for menus because of historical changes. We didn't want to break, so we had new interfaces. Now there is only one interface, and it's also much simpler, actually. It's called the iNavigation Provider, like in Orchard. But this way, in this version, iNavigation Provider doesn't have a property with the name it supports. It's called with the name. So you can even serve multiple menus. So you could add the entry to all the menus, if you want, with a single provider. So you are called to build a navigation with the name of the menu to build and with a navigation builder which will let you alter the graph the tree of menu items okay and the menu item is still a menu item but now it's fully documented look at that comments everywhere uh, so when you create a menu item a menu item being just the the in-memory representation of the menu you define the text of the menu 
which is a localized string. Oh, by the way, while I'm looking at ASP.NET 5 and VC6 compared to Orchard, localized string looks a lot like what we have in Orchard, right? Because we have something called localized string in Orchard. Guess what? It's actually in ASP.NET 5 now. So again, everything which has to be rendered in the text should use localized string. And there is a service to return localized strings. And yeah, that's how it works. Beautiful. Uh, the ID of the menu item in terms of uh, HTML, the link of the menu item, in, but you should not set it. It will be automatically uh, created based on the URL or the route values when you create a menu item. Um, I kept local, it was called local nav, and now it's called local, meaning, yeah, I, I didn't remember what it was for. It's actually when um, you create a menu item that should be rendered inside the page. A good example is on the themes. If you go on the themes page, there will be a installed tab, a gallery tab, and another tab, or same thing for the modules. These tabs, they are not actual tabs. There are links to other routes, but they are rendered like tabs. This is the local Boolean. Um, so same thing as in Orchard 1. Um, nothing special. So I navigation provider. And what I did is um, implement um, the navigation provider for the admin menu. Because the admin, so this thing will be called also for the front end menus. Whenever you create a menu as a content item and we want to render it, this thing will be called with the name of the menu. And the default implementation will look if there is a content item with this name and fill this menu with the content item itself. Okay? All the things that you have in your navigation, like in Orchard 1. But for the admin menu, we use something like this. In the themes module, I have an admin menu class, like in Orchard 1, that will do build navigation, like in Orchard 1, but now we'll have name as a, as a parameter. And you say, oh, is it for the admin menu? No, let's quit, nothing to do. But if it's for the admin menu, I will add the themes entry and the sub uh, entry called installed, okay, as local navigation, like in Orchard 1. I kept the same example. And I can filter on permissions, which is also uh, uh, half uh, implemented in Orchard 2 now. So this is this implementation is will be almost the same as in Orchard One, so very straightforward to migrate. Uh, but otherwise, the rendering engine, the rendering pipeline is much simpler, and the navigation manager actually will call all the navigation providers, will call them to say build navigation for this menu, and then we'll apply a very simple set of pipelines. Remember what we have in Orchard One? We talked about it last week. It was a mess. Now reduce to only re to remove the unauthorized menu items, uh, arrange to organize all the menu items into a correct hierarchy, um, because the same node might come from different navigation providers and then compute all the URLs, compute the href, href property based on URL and route values, and then just return the menu items. Done, that's it. This is not cached, this is run every time that build menu is, is called. Then how we render the admin menu, almost like in Orchard 1, which is by using another module, which is in the core modules called navigation, that depends on the dashboard, which implements the admin feature, I will show you. And this is a menu shape. The menu shapes are just a shape table provider where we define what a menu is with classes and alternates like Orchard 1. But there is a new thing, which is unprocessing. Un this is very new to, to Orchard 2. Unprocessing is called only when the shape itself is rendered, just before it's rendered. This way, we can um, load some content for the shape uh, from the database, for instance. In this case, when a menu is rendered, um, a, a menu shape is rendered, okay, menu shape, it doesn't have any state, it's just create new menu and render it. Uh, it will uh, call the navigation manager to build the menu and get all the menu items and then populate the shape with all the menu items by creating all the shapes for all the menu items, okay? And this thing is called in um, admin menu filter. And this filter will only run on the admin, okay? If it's a view result, if I am on the admin, then create a shape, an empty shape called menu with a property called menu name admin and a route data of the current uh, request. And uh, this is for after. 
Uh, and when you just call that and you say, give me the layout and add the menu shape in the navigation zone of the layout, and we are in the admin, then when this thing will be rendered, it will call the processing to, f to load all the menu items from all the providers. But if this thing is not processed, it means it has been cached because now we can cache every shape like I explained two weeks ago. The metadata has a cache context where you can define a cache ID. If you assign the cache ID to the cache context of a shape, it will be cached. Okay, And it will be cached based on the properties you give it. For instance, here, the menu admin will be different whenever the combination of holes is different. Let's say I'm an admin, administrator, I have only the roles administrator, there will be one menu uh, entry in the cache for the administrator's role. If you are just editor, there will be another entry for the menu. If you are editor and contributor, again, another entry for the menu. Okay. Uh, and then we will invalidate the, these entries every time the features thing changes. Every time there is a new feature, it will just invalidate the admin menu, all the admin menus uh, implementation based for every role, okay, using tags. So this is the context here as just to create as many menu, uh, as many cached entries per vari variations of that. This is a discriminator. And the tags are just to invalidate the thing that has been cached. In this case, all of these menus are invalidated, okay? Um, and this is implemented using um, eye shape display events like in Orchard 1 to intercept the displaying and displayed. Uh, and this is actually a different module. Dynamic cache. When enabled, it will intercept every displaying and every displayed event. And on displaying, if the shape you are trying to display has a cache ID, then it will use the i distributed cache from ASP.NET 5 to render. Where is that? Displaying. Oh, sorry. When it's displayed, it will use what has been used to ren to render the thing, which is which is context or child content. We write it to a stream to a string and we save it in the cache. And when it's displaying we assign it from the cache automatically. And the display shape um, processing, because there is a child content before in, in a displaying event, it will say, oh, someone assigned the child content of the context to something. So we don't need to call process. We just render what it is. So the full um, menu shape processing uh, will be ignored. So we won't have to reload all the menu items. It will t be taken from the cache. And, uh, and it works, it's beautiful. Let me show you because I, it's over time now and I will run it. So Sebastian, this also means that the menu width will be greatly optimized because it will only render Wait. this Wait. root shape or... Wait, um, oh crap. Um, the build errors that I included this morning. Uh, yes, no. Um, so here what you see is that the admin menu filter defined, defined the cache ID just for the menu admin. So if I took it this way, the widgets will not be cached. The widgets are shapes. They are not cached. The menu building is not cached. It's just the rendering of a menu admin here, of a menu a shape for the admin in this case, but we can cache all the widgets and very specific widgets also. What we will do is when from a driver, a widget driver, we return the widget shape or the specific widget menu shape, we can assign some cache properties there. And we won't say roles, or maybe we won't, it depends. Uh, but yes, it will be cached, but, but only if you define these properties. It's not uh, automatic it's opt-in every shape you create will define these properties invalidation context and cache ID always but yes then it will be possible to just cache a widget so the server is running and I can just say host this one is in 
index. So when I go on the index page, it's loading the index route of the demo module, which will just show me a form to create a content item. And this one is on the front end. So because it's on the front end, it won't work. <laughs> Crap, broke everything. <clears throat> Ah, okay, I broke everything with my, I didn't test this morning. Well, sorry, demo fail. But the front end is using a theme, the back end is using another theme. I created two themes. I created the, um, the theme, which is a front end one, and I created the admin f theme, which is a back end one. The front end is using, is specifying the layout, which is pointing to the Bootstrap 3 online. And the back end, just, just, there is nothing defined, but decided, just, this is how I did that so far. The back end one, just to validate the um, assets pipeline, is using, you see, tilde slash the admin, so a local asset which is served as a static file, the admin.min.css, which is rendered from my assets, which here are defining bootstrap.scss from my resources module. Okay, look at that, it's beautiful. Um, I'm defining two inputs for invalidation. There is one, so bootstrap4 is in the resources module. And my local scss file, so sas file, here, is referencing this user one. Well, it's just a custom one, customization one. So the both of them will be um, executed and rendered into the admin.css and .min.css automatically. Okay, same thing for the JS files. And this way, I can just point to the admin.min.css, which will be mine, based on the original Bootstrap plus my uh, changes in SAS. Um, here, so this is Bootstrap 4. Okay, and this is a simple layout using bootstrap this is for the admin and you will see that 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 here i'm rendering a section called navigation because the admin menu filter will inject the admin menu inside the navigation and it works i can't show you because i broke the build but um but it works uh, hey so <clears throat> so these aren't uh, zone shapes or shape zones but actual yes. eraser sections Yes, if you look at the implementation of this thing, it's overriding the the default razor page for our razor pages, and in the end, when you call razor section uh, render section, it will call the layout with the name of that you want. Oh. So, just, so you missed the meeting apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this way it's the same. You can still call uh, display and uh, theme layout dot navigation this will do exactly the same thing but i thought it would be simpler for users to just stick with the mvc um, way of doing things and uh, also what i did uh, recently is change display look at that display oh it doesn't work display is a method that takes a dynamic and that can be documented and returns the HTML content. And there is also new dot something that is used to create items. So the two of them are available, So, but they are in internally the same display helper. This way we use new dot foo to create a shape and we use display like this, oh yes, it's there, with a shape to render it. There is no more ambiguity. I will also add display children. Uh, something I change also in the shapes is that now, by default, every uh, shape will order all its uh, children automatically when you add them. So if you say foo.add and you say a bar, another shape, and a position, it will be ordered in foo automatically. You don't have to call at order shape dot whatever. Uh, they are ordered when they are rendered based on the position by default. There is no more. Is it possible to pass in the model? So if you have a custom model going into your shape, and then you want to pass it into like a partial or another one that's within that, just passing in the same model, is that possible? This uh, you can pass any model as a property of the shape because the issue is that when you render the shape, the shape itself will be the model. What you can do is a strongly typed shape, 
and you are not at Amsterdam, but you need to watch the video I made from Amsterdam explaining how to do uh, strongly type shape. The idea is that when you do new, or I think you have access to the, well, this thing, the display helper. No, the eye shape factory. There is no eye shape factory here. Let me see, shape factory. There is a, yes, this one. Oh, no, shape factory. The shape factory. Yeah, because I tried to do that. Yeah. No, I follow. Because uh, I tried to do that with shape factory. And when I was passing in the current model, so like, let's say the model is strongly typed. I was passing that model into the shape. I would get an error because the shape was expecting the strongly typed model, but it would become a dynamic, like an orchard shape. Yeah, I need to check. So you saw yeah, the but video. But this isn't this is an Orchard one. Okay, you yeah, saw the yeah, video. Yeah, I'll watch the video. Okay. I can I can check again in Orchard two just to see. But if it can make things uh, easier for you, yeah, I I can look into that. Mm. So yeah, I also looked into view components which actually are very strong type, but it's too limited. Um, maybe what you need is a view component in MVC six. Not a shape. Well, we'll, we'll see. You, you send me the, your yeah. example, and I'll, I'll see what should be done. Uh, okay, I think yeah, that's I, could, it. I, I can also watch the video. Can you post the link to the video somewhere? Or where was that? Amsterdam. It's on the Orchard channel on YouTube. Amsterdam. Gotcha. Okay. Should be easy. Thank you. Um, this, don't care. Oh, I also changed all the shape rendering pipeline to be async. Everything is async. The only thing which are not async right now are just the events themselves, like displaying and display. They are not async. They should be. They will be. But um, otherwise, yeah, if I look, oh, I can show you here, actually. Yeah, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, can tag helpers be asynchronous? They are, yes. Cool. So those uh, those awaits that you had uh, in the the previous view that you this, were showing this one this is yeah, a tag helper it could be right it could I assume yeah maybe there is yeah and well actually interesting yes it could be let me think uh, we could make a tag helper for zo yeah we we talked about it actually didn't we like yeah well zone. We, now that we have tag helpers we should avoid having inline code like that right? okay so this is the layout and i just followed the same layout template as mvc6 but what you will do in your views well we could also replace that with zone a zone thing we could have a zone mm -hmm. shape shape tag helper yeah and name equals header we could do that yep. that would be better i'm wondering No, no, it doesn't. Yeah. But yeah, we can already do a, yeah. For those who didn't see the demo two months ago, in the module, which is in the modules folder, in the demo, in the views here, bar, foo, Yeah, you can do that. So instead of new.baz to render, you can just do baz. And it will create a new shape called baz and render with these properties. Oh, so, because, yeah, so something you can do today right now, this way is that now you can do menu and do menu name equals this will render the menu admin, the admin menu, like this, as is. So yes, this works. But not for zones yet. You can do zone, but it will create a new zone. You can't specify an existing zone. So we need a new shape tag helper for that. Questions? Because it's taking a long time now. I will keep some things for next week. The actual demo. Okay, good. Um, thanks, everyone. See you on Tuesday, January the 5th. Right? Yep. Thanks. Happy New Year. 
Thank you. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye, Bye, guys.